Our theme verse for today is from the, uh, one of the pastoral epistles, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And the words are, here is a trustworthy saying. One who deserves, aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Let's read that together. One who does, here's a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. There's a whole collection of books in the New Testament, First and Second Timothy and Titus, and they're called the pastoral epistles. They're written for pastors as they seek to be humble leaders who are equipping God's people so that all may know Jesus. In our community, we heard an announcement uh, more than uh, four or five months ago. We heard the announcement of the shepherd, the overseer of this community, Pastor Jeff Scheich, who is a remarkable pastor, uh, a gift as, as a friend to me and also a blessing to this community and wherever he happens to go. And Pastor Scheich made the announcement that not this December, but next December, did you hear, did I remind you? Okay, not this December, but next December, he is gonna enter into a time of retirement. I think that God has great things in store for Melinda. And since he's out of the country, I thought I'd talk about him for, for an hour this morning. Since he's far away in the footsteps of Paul, I thought I'd share just a few minutes actually around this uh, passage as we as a congregation prepare over the next year or so of time, year and two months, as we prepare for the next shepherd that will serve in this community. And since we're there, I as your director of ministry, Pastor Michael, um, I want to tell you that there is good news and there's bad news. There's good news and there's bad news. Who, who wants to hear the good news first? Who wants to hear the bad news first? Okay, so the bad news is there's only one Jeff Shike as a pastor. There's only one. Some of you are going, I thought that was the good news. There's only one Jeff Scheich with the gifts that he has, the abilities that he has, and, and the leadership that he has. There's only one Pastor Jeff Scheich. And the good news is, Pastor Scheich, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has prepared us for what comes next. He has prepared us not only to equip us so that everything we do, we do for the singular person purpose that all may know Jesus. He has prepared us by equipping us to know how to open our Bibles, how to own our faith, how to be the people that God has called us to be, how to welcome people into our community. The good news is we are prepared for a time such as this. So as we we take a time to ponder and wonder about a pastor, an overseer in our congregation, an overseer of God's people. I, I want to share a couple of, uh, of ways to look at the role of a pastor. And some of this is historical. Some of it's the way that the church has responded to pastors in terms of the church over the centuries. And for some, it's some newly planted congregations that are just getting a start. The first posture that I, I want to show to you is, is this posture right here. Some folks have the understanding that the pastor is the Pope, Pape in Italian, Latin, Pope Father. The, the pastor is the Pope of the congregation that he is the one who tells people what to do and they had better well do it. That's not Pastor Scheich, that's Pastor Echo Camp. Okay, now we got that straight. This has some good things to it. 
It's effective, it's efficient, there's clarity, there's direction, and so forth. But this isn't the intent that God has for the pastor and the people, the congregation that he serves. What happens is we look up to that pastor and that imperfect pastor could never imitate perfectly the great pastor Jesus, our Savior, the good shepherd that we sung about. When you put your pastor on a pedestal, he is bound to fall off of that pedestal. In reality, pastors need the very same grace and forgiveness that they proclaim to you. He needs that from Jesus himself. This is not a healthy way of being a pastor. And now, I'm going to turn it over like this. Some churches have the view of a pastor like this. Here are the people. Here's the pastor. Pastor, it's your job to keep every single one of us happy. Pastor, we pay you to deliver a message that is outright safe. Don't hurt my feelings. Don't meddle in my business. Tell me what I want to hear. Make me comfy. Make me happy. That's your job, pastor. Or, or the pastor's job is to make sure everything gets done. After all, that's why we pay you. You're the pastor. And this is an exceptionally unhealthy way to view one who desires to be an overseer, a pastor in a community. This is not good, and this is not good. From the pastoral epistles, from those First and Second Timothy and Titus and, and the other pastoral epistles that are written to help pastors, really we see this biblical view. Because why we do what we do and how we do it always has to flow from the pages of Scripture, not from tradition and not from culture and not what we think we want. And from the pages of Scripture, it's abundantly obvious that it's not this, it's not this, but rather it's this. That the pastor is called to equip God's people to grow, as we said in Eisen's baptism, God's love, God's word, and God's forgiveness. The pastor's responsibility is not to take the place of Jesus, but to point us always to Jesus, the author, the perfecter, and the giver of our faith. The pastor is called to identify those gifts, raise people up in their gifts in order to do the great command to love God because he first loved us, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because in Jesus, God loved us with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, all his strength, and to love our neighbor as we learn to love ourselves. That is the ultimate work of a shepherd, an overseer, a bishop, if you will. So let's go back to our theme verse for just a moment, and let's read that verse together again. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. So what's the process? How do we call, how do we bring a new pastor into our community? On our church's website, you will find this chart. Now, we intentionally left the print really small so you couldn't ask me any questions this morning. But we wanted you to see that there is a definite pattern and purposeful journey that we are taking for this call process. There's a definite timeline that we're saying, God, we're going to do our best, and we're going to trust you with the outcome of that. I want to tell you, we do not have 
the next pastor for the Yankee Hill, community Yankee Hill sanctuary, san, uh, pastor. We don't have the next pastor picked out. We do not know who that is. We have, under the amazing administrative leadership of Autumn Crable, of our community, we have under the amazing leadership of Autumn Crable a definite pattern and purposeful process. We have submitted a whole group of names from people throughout our community. We have called a call committee, people representing this congregation, and they are praying for and encouraging one another and walking through names and information and so forth. And then we're going to gather to bring those names down to a few names. And then ultimately, they will give a recommendation to your director of ministries who will approach our congregation and say, we believe that we should call this person. And that person can say yes, that person can say no, and we're going to trust God's timing along the way. We are not in a hurry, but we're also very purposeful in why we do what we do. So what are we looking for? What is this call committee, this representation of our community, what are the traits that they're looking for? And I want to tell you, we are looking for a pastor who is in good shape. I don't think you could see me flex. Let me step out of it. There, there we go. All right. So we are looking for a pastor who is in good shape. Any questions? Good. I guess we can move on then. All right. Good shape. What is shape? Let's put those letters up on the board for you. S-H-A-P-E. The first one that starts with an S, what does it say? We recognize that God has given everyone unique and remarkable spiritual gifts. And we want a pastor who recognizes his giftedness, his particular, I don't say this in a bad way, his peculiar spiritual gifts. And we want that person not to leave, lead exactly like Pastor Shike, but we want that person to lead from the giftedness that God has entrusted to him. Second of all, we want a pastor, the H stands for heart. I guess I could say heart and interest. The H, we want someone who has a heart for God, who has a heart for people, and who has a heart for his family, who has a heart for his community. Someone who will not just operate with the understanding of Latin and Greek and German and Hebrew and history and tradition. All those things are helpful things. But a heart that breaks when people's lives are broken, and a heart that rejoices when people's hearts are celebrating along the way. The A stands for abilities. We want someone who understands that God has wired them in a unique and remarkable way, that they have abilities, and they're going to use those abilities to the glory of God and they're also going to use those abilities to help guide us to recognize the abilities that God has given to us in our community, in our congregation. The P stands for personality. Personality. He doesn't have to sacrifice who he is. He gets to celebrate the unique way that God has given him a shape. And it will be a different personality. And some of you one day will meet our new pastor and you'll go almost instantly, nope, don't like him. I remember the first day that I served as pastor in Denver, Colorado, which would be 20, almost 20 years I served there. And there was a gentleman who met me at the door one of the first people I met, and he said these words, there's not been a pastor yet who's like me. And I said, I don't like you already. <laughs> and he was right, actually. I grew to love him and care about him, and he did the same for me. And the last one is E, experiences. 
Collected in our congregation is a wide, wide variety of experiences. There are some in our congregation who I think came over on the boat with uh, the first Lutherans in America. There are folks who, who memorized the catechism in German and English and Slovak and whatever other form it happened to be in. And there are others in our congregation who have no clue what a Lutheran is. I'm going to give you something here in the middle of that. It's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. We're looking for a pastor who understands their shape. And that that, though that shape helps lead and guide that person to help lead and to guide us. Throughout scripture, there's a lot of different uh, terminologies that are used for a pastor. Here's a list of them. Pastor, that's just a Latin word for shepherd. A pastor is an under shepherd. He doesn't take the place of Jesus. Instead, he points people to Jesus. He reminds them that Jesus is the savior, not the pastor. Episcopal. Episcopal is an understanding of an office holder, someone who holds an office. So when I say to you, I have good news for you, as a pastor, I, you are forgiven, I'm proclaiming to you what God has said in his word. And you do the same thing in the life of those you interact with. When someone says, I'm sorry, you get to say the words, I forgive you. And God forgives you, and God honors that. Presbyter, I suffer from a very strange disease called presbyopia. At 61 years old, suddenly, print on a page, It's the strangest thing. 20 years ago, I could read this with no problem. Presbyopia means old eyes. Presbyter, somebody who has experience and wisdom, who's been around the block and understands at the end of the day it belongs to Jesus. Bishop, someone who oversees other pastors someone who oversees a larger community. They're a bishop and overseer, or the same words. Elder, presbyter, older person. Not not an elder as in, hey, we have a board of elders, but an elder as someone who's recognized by the community. Priest. Not that that we serve as a priest on behalf of other people, but we serve as someone who hears and loves and prays for and cares for in the name of Jesus. Evangelist, prophet, teacher, those are the terms that we use there. And so as we look at various terms, I'm going to share with you something that's really important to me. I'm just going to say it this way for me. I'm an imperfect person loved by a perfect God. I am definitely an imperfect pastor who is loved and forgiven by the perfect shepherd pastor, Jesus. And it's absolutely essential that we understand the church doesn't belong to me and it doesn't belong to you. It's God's church to God's glory by God's grace alone. I've had the opportunity for years to serve as a mentor to pastors. I've had the opportunity to work with our seminary, to work with second year uh, seminarians who are going into their internship, and then I've worked with fourth year students who are about to be unleashed on the world, on the church body. Four-year students who have gone through 12 years of higher education to make certain that they are ready, and they are ready to unleash upon their congregations everything they know in their first sermon. 
But really, there's two questions that need to be answered. Two questions for a pastor, I believe, to be successful in a community. The first question is this. Does he love people? And the second question is equally important. Does he allow people to love him? Some some pastors and seminaries learned, uh uh-uh, can't have friends in the church, Uh uh-uh, can't have close relationships with the body of Christ. We're called to love and care for one another. And pastors also need to allow the congregation to love and care for him as well. And, And so, as we say it in a different way, this next slide here, in our community, does he love people who do not know Jesus? Because we exist for those who yet, what? Do not know Jesus. That's, that's right. Because it's all to the glory of God. That's the vision that we have that all may know Jesus. And then, does he love equipping you to be able to love in the name of Jesus as well. The staff is kind of laughing at me right now. (laughs) There's a different reason every week, but here's the reason for this week. At 2.11, every day, my watch goes off. At 2.11, every single day, I have my watch set. I stop whatever I'm doing, And I pray for the next campus pastor that God is leading to our community. And so I'm going to ask you, would you set the alarm on your watch? Would you put a note out there that says, you know what, at 2.11 each day, I'm going to remember and pray for my pastor? Now, it can be 2.11 a.m. if you want or p.m. if you want. That's, That's your decision. But I invite you to do that as we look and prepare for the person that God is going to bring to help us love our neighbors in the name of Jesus. Let's pray.